أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين ولعنة الله على أعدائهم أجمعين من الآن إلى قيام يوم الدين Okay I was requested to take up this session on tafsir but uh, while uh, you have been constantly listening to uh, the tafsir over several years i believe there is something that in the sciences of the in the learning of the quran you have something which is called tafsir and there is something which is called ulum al quran before somebody can embark on the actual tafsir and understanding the quran there are certain basic fundamental information sciences and knowledge he needs to acquire if he has to understand tafsir in the absence of those knowledge you will not be able to understand what the quran is saying now the science itself is a very it's a very vast science it is referred to as ulum al quran the sciences of the quran It's just like in order to understand fiqh, you have to know the usul of fiqh. That means the principles of fiqh. You don't know the principles of fiqh, you will not be able to understand fiqh. So it's like an algebra or in geometry. Till you don't know the theorem of Pythagoras, you will not be able to uh, solve problems on the right angle triangles. <laughs> Similarly, in Quran, if you want to understand tafsir, till you don't understand ulum al-Quran, you will not be able to appreciate what the Quran is talking about because it it builds up certain formulae certain theorems certain basic background in the absence of which you don't understand the quran appropriately one of the things in ulum al quran that is that is discussed and this itself is a very wide field so you need to study it for four years three years four years before you can actually go into tafsir so tafsir is not a small thing that you pick up the quran four years of preparation to understand tafsir then you go into tafsir And then when you go into that tafsir, then your Hawaiatullah Jawad Amli, who's been teaching, giving the dars of tafsir for the past 16, 17 years, and he's just reached surah number 20 in this tafsir. So that's how deep it goes. In, tafsir, in Ulum al-Quran, you have something which is called shan and nuzul <coughs> shan and nuzul is a discussion on... The Quran came down in a period of 23 years. So Iqra bism rabbik alladhi khalaq was the first ayah that came. And then over the period of 23 years, the entire Quran came. So the first five verses of Surah Alaq was revealed. After that, for a period of three years, there was no revelation. It was completely stopped, nothing. And that was a time that was very difficult for the Holy Prophet. He's announced, I'm the Prophet of God. He's announced that I'm bringing the Quran, the Word of God. Five verses come, three years, absolute stop. People are saying, where is your Quran? You started with five verses. You made big claims. So now where is your Quran? He says, I don't know. I'm waiting for it to come because I'm not manufacturing it. Three years it did not come and then it started again. So the entire Quran was revealed over a period of 23 years. There are two types of revelations of the Quran. One is the entire Quran revealed in its original form, its primary es essence, its inherent state of nur at one go on the prophet this is referred to as inna anzalnahu fi laylatul qadr night of qadr we reveal it into your heart the entire essence from the lohe mahfud from the guarded tablet the whole quran you put it into your heart but that was only for the holy prophet not for you and me for you and me it has to come over a period of 23 years that's how it came that is called tanzil gradual piecemeal piecemeal ayat by ayat verse by verse, surah by surah. How are these revelations, or how were these revelations that came down piecemeal dictated? So incidences would take place on ground zero. Allah would notice, the, would observe what situations are coming, and pertinent to the events that would take place, he would send down the verses. So when the Holy Prophet is now after the final Hajjat al-Wida, he's now going back, at that time it comes, Ya Ayyuh Rasul al O Prophet, now make the announcement of Ali being the Wali. So based on Ghadir al the incident, Allah sends down the verses of Ghadir. 
when Mubahala is supposed to take place, the talk between the Christians of Najran come, then he says, Qul ta'alu nid'u abnana wa abnakum wa abnisana wa nisakum wa anfusana wa anfus. Call your sons, I call my sons. Call your ladies, I call my ladies. Call your sons, I call my sons. So based on events that would take place, they would, the verses would be revealed. This is called shan and nuzul Classical example of shan and nuzul it's, it's important, it's good to know. See, after the incident of Ghadira, a lot of people rejected it. So based on events that would take place, the verses would be revealed. A classical example, very nice, so that we know what is happening. Probably not many of us would be knowing this. <coughs> After the incident of Ghadir that takes place, the Holy Prophet, the entire the congregation disperses. Those who are going to Sham, go to Sham. Those who are going to Kufa, go to Kufa. Those who are going to Basra, go to Basra. Those who are coming to Medina with the Holy Prophet turn to Medina. When they reach Medina, after having performed the incident of Ghadir, a man by the name of Haris the Fa'ri comes to the Holy Prophet. He says, Ya Rasulullah, it has reached, I was not with you when you were going for Hajjid al Bida. But it has reached me, information has reached me that you have made an announcement of Man Kunsu Mawlahu Fahad Ali and Mila. That you've made the announcement that after you the successor is Ali. So he said, Yes, I've made the announcement. He says, he cho don't, Tone changes. First it was Ya Rasulullah. He says, Muhammad, listen. When you first came, we were worshipping the idols. <coughs> you told us, don't worship the idols. We stopped worshipping the idols. Then you said, we need to start praying towards one God. He said, we'll start praying towards one God. You said, fast, we fasted. You said, pray salat, we prayed salat. You said, give khums, we started giving khums. Now you have come and put your cousin and your son-in-law over us as a representative, as your successor. I want to ask you one thing. Is this what you're saying from out of your own whims and your own desires or is it as a result of the rulings of God so the prophet says look I don't do anything that from myself I don't speak anything out of man whatever I make an announcement it is because of God this revad say this man turns takes two steps looks up to the skies raises his hands and he says Allahumma O Lord, if what Muhammad is saying about the appointment of Ali as a successor after him is correct and it's come from you, show me the signs because I don't believe this. If this is true, send an adab from the skies upon me at this moment. Sorry? As soon as he said it, Rawad say a stone drops up from the skies hits him on the head. The tradition says, hits him on the head, comes out from the anus. That man dies over there. And the first two verses of Surah Ma'arij comes down. Sa'ala sa'ilun bi'adha. Surah Ma'arij, the Quran. Sa'ala sa'ilun bi'adha bin waqi'a. Laysa lil kafir lahu dafi'a. That the sa'il, the questioner, asked for an azab from God. For a kafir, the azab will never be turned away. Now, I, what I'm trying to prove is that occasions would take place and the revelations would come. Incidences on ground would take place and their ayat would be, would be revealed. But this background, I want to take this a little further. And that is that this shan and nuzul and the revelation that takes place, it's based on historical events. So events would take place and the revelation would come. These play a very important role in a lot of our fiqh issues. And specifically, Ayatollah Sistani has a very potent view, a very meticulous view, when he's giving the fatwas, he's one of those very few individuals and very few marajim who gives excessive importance to the to historical events taking place at the time when the verses are revealed to give a better understanding of what exactly took place. Because if you minus the historical context of the way of the revelation, you would not know why this verse was revealed. So whenever he's giving fatwa, one of the things he does is that while he looks at the ayat and the Quran, and the sunnah, one of the things he pays meticulous attention is, is to historical background at that point of time when this particular verse was revealed. Now I wanted to take you and I want to show you how the shan and nuzul, the occasions for revelation, the occasions for which certain ayat come down, how they play a very important role in identifying the fiqh rulings. I want to take you to the Quran. In Quran, in, in Surah Baqarah, in Surah Baqarah, 
from verse number 142. 142, 143, 144, 145. These are five verses. Remember in the majlis I mentioned. From verse number 124 to 129 of Surah Baqarah. Allah talks about, and I mentioned 15 lectures, Allah talks about the importance of the Kaaba, how it was built, how the dimensions came, how the measurements came, how the location came, how the design came, what happened, what happened, what happened, what happened. All that was a precursor for the, these verses. What are these verses in Surah Baqarah 142, 143, 144, 145? These verses talk about a very important event that most of us, when we go to Umrah, we do visit. That is the Masjid al Dhu Qiblatain, the two Qiblas. If you remember, initially when the Holy Prophet was in Makkah, he was asked to pray, uh, pray, pray Salat in Baytul, towards Baytul Maqdis. It's either Al Baytul Maqdis or Baytul Maqdis. Arabic grammar, you have to use it that way. We were playing towards Jerusalem. From the time Salat was ordained upon the Holy Prophet, he would turn towards Jerusalem, Baytul Maqdis. When he comes to Mac from, Madi from Mecca to Medina, he migrates to Rabat. One Rabat says after 13 months. Another Rabat says after 17 months. The ruling comes. Change the direction from the Bayt al maqdis to the Kaaba. This takes place in that masjid which is called Masjid al dhu Qiblatain. dhu Qiblatain means a masjid that has two Qiblas. So in a prayer, he started to pray. In the middle of the prayer, Jibreel comes and says, turn. So he's facing Bayt al maqdis So that is one Qibla. Then he says, now face the other Qibla, Baytul Masjid al Haram. And so the second Qibla comes. And that's why it's called Masjid al Qiblatain. Again, I mentioned Hassan, Hassanain, Dhuhr, Dhuhrain, Maghrib, Maghribain, Qibla, Qiblatain, two Qiblas. Masjid in which there are two Qiblas. These verses talk about that. But look at what God says in verse number 142 and how the ruling comes out from the Shan and Uzul. This is Sayyakulu Sufaha. This verse Sayyakulu Sufaha, just for your understanding. Normally, when I give dars of tafsir, I always recommend that people need to take Quran to understand. This is not a majlis, this is tafsir. So you have to have the Quran to actually read it. That's what I'm talking about. So normally I recommend if you have the, the Quran, it's mobiles, everybody has it. You can always take it out, look at the translation. But this Sayyakul, verse number 142 of Surah Baqarah, Sayyakulu Sufaha. You know, to get a clear understanding of what this verse is, when you start reading the Quran in the month of Ramadan, the black line that is the verse look very shortly i'm going to he's paving the groundwork of a ruling that's going to come changing the qibla but before changing the qibla he's preparing the groundwork he saying sayaqulu sufaha very shortly sufaha means the foolish people it says, very shortly, foolish people amongst you, men and nas from the people, will start objecting to you. Very shortly, I'm going to tell you to change the Qibla. When I do that, they will keep saying, Ma an kanu aliha. What was wrong with these Muslims that to change the Qibla? When the ruling of the change of Qibla came, in the middle of the prayers, Jibreel comes, Muhammad, turn. Now, I know it is haram to turn your face from the Qibla. In the middle of the Salat, it breaks the prayers. But God wants you to turn in the middle of the prayers. Turn. He takes his hand makes him turn. God is saying, when this happens, a lot of objections would come. And the objections came. The objections are of two, were of four kinds. We don't have time. I'll just give you major two ones so that we can limit ourselves to the 20 minutes. The question came was, all the people, because now he's migrated from Mecca to Medina, 13 months, 17 months, whatever, the ruling comes. S the objections start. The objections are of twofold. One, you've changed the Qibla from Baytul Maqdis to, to the Holy Kaaba. Now, what does this mean? It means that if Baytul Maqdis was correct initially that you were turning towards and praying, that means now that you've turned to the Holy Kaaba is not correct. Or if Baytul Maqdis was not correct and the Qibla was originally supposed to be the Kaaba, then what did you do in all those times turning to Baytul Maqdis? You get, the, you, get, you get the understanding? If you were praying before Baytul Maqdis, then either Baytul Maqdis is correct or Khane Kaaba is correct. If Baytul Maqdis was correct, why did you turn to Kaaba now? And if the Kaaba is the correct Qibla, then why were you facing the Baytul Maqdis one? And what happens to all those years of namaz that you recited towards Baytul Maqdis? Because now you've changed to the Kaaba. And this is the correct one. So what happens to all those prayers? Ajab it created an 
એક એવું ગૌગાત ખ્યાલ ચાલુ થઈ ગયું ત્યાં મદીનામાં એનું શું કરવાનું શું કીએ પેલું સહી કરેક્ટ છે તો આ ગલત અગર જો આ સહી છે તો પેલું ગલત તો આટલા વર્ષની ઇબાદત જે છે નવા શું થાય નો દિસ ઇઝ વેર અલ્લાહ કમ્સ ડાઉન ઇસ ઇઝ ડોન્ટ બોધ વિથ ધ ડિરેક્શન્સ વાય યુ બોધ ઇટ અબાઉટ બૈતુલ મકદસ ઓર બૈતુલ ઓર ઓર મસ્જિદુલ હરામ વેન દે સે ઠેલ દેમ કુલ વર્સ નંબર હન્ડ્રેડ એન્ડ ફોર્ટી ટુ સોરા બકરા ઇસ ઇઝ કુલ લીલા હિલ મશરક વલ મગરબ ડોન્ટ ગેટ કોટ અપ ઇન ડિરેક્શન ધ બૈતુલ મકદસ એન્ડ એન્ડ મસ્જિદુલ હરામ અન્ડરસ્ટેન્ડ લીલા હિલ મશરક વલ મગરબ યુ ગો ટુ ધ લેફ્ટ ઇટ બિલોંગ્સ ટુ ગોડ યુ ટર્ન ટુ ધ રાઇટ ઇટ બિલોંગ્સ ટુ ગોડ યુ ટર્ન ટુ ધ ઈસ્ટ ઇટ બિલોંગ્સ ટુ ગોડ યુ ટર્ન ટુ ધ વેસ્ટ ઇટ બિલોંગ્સ ટુ ગોડ બેસિકલી ઇફ યુ ગેટ ટુ ડિરેક્શન યુ ગેટ ઓલ ધ ડિરેક્શન યુ ગેટ ઈસ્ટ એન્ડ વેસ્ટ યુ ઓટોમેટિકલી ગેટિંગ નોર્થ એન્ડ સાઉથ સો બેસિકલી ઇન અ શોર્ટ સસિંગ સેન્ટેન્સ ગોડ ઇઝ સિંગ લિસન યુ ટર્ન ટુ ધ ઈસ્ટ ઇટ બિલોંગ્સ ટુ મી યુ ટર્ન ટુ ધ વેસ્ટ ઇટ બિલોંગ્સ ટુ મી You turn to the north, it belongs to me. You turn to the south, it belongs to me. Don't get yourself entangled in turning and facing towards Qibla was uh, Bayt al-Maqdis was correct or turning and facing towards Kaaba was correct. Wherever you turn is my direction because I have created the direction. Fair enough, this was the occasion of revelation. What took place, I'm really summarizing it. This, this, this itself is another five, six lectures we can discuss on this three, four verses. But understand, the entire situation, the verses came. It says, you answer them by stating, don't get entangled in places. Get understanding your right, your understanding right about the direction. All directions belong to Allah. So you turn to Bayt al-Maqdas, it is the direction of God, it is correct. You turn to Masjid al-Haram, it's uh, the, the Kaaba, it belongs to God, it is correct. But with this, the ulama come up with a big fiqhi ruling. And this is what I wanted to convey. And hence all the background and the, and the, and the, and the preparatory talk. It says, when Allah says, قُلْ لِلَّهِ الْمَشْرِكَ وَالْمَغْرِبِ East belongs to God, West belongs to God. This is the verse that the ulama and the mujtahideen and the maraji take to give out one specific fiqhi ruling about salat. In salat, we know, in the wajib salat, we're supposed to be facing the qibla. But that ruling is only for the wajib prayers, not for the mustahab prayers. Mustahab prayers, you don't need to face the qibla. Mustahab prayers, you can pray even without facing the qibla. So individuals are sitting over there facing that direction at that point, at this point. While I'm talking, you can pray your salat facing there. And this is specifically in the case, not when you're stationary, with the caveat, not when you're stationary, but in a state of motion. All the mujtahideen, Ayatullah Khui, Ayatullah Khumaini, Ayatullah Marhum, Ayatullah Khui, everyone, based on this. It says, if you are in a state of motion, If you are on a motorcycle, if you are in a car, if you are in a bus, if you are full on, full on, you're traveling. Mustahab prayers, you don't need to face the Qibla. You don't need to face the Kaaba. The condition of facing the Kaaba is only in Salatul Wajib when you're stationary. Or Salatul Mustahab when you're stationary. But if Salatul Mustahab is being prayed while you're traveling, you don't need to face the Qibla. But then the question comes, if you're facing, if you're traveling, if you're moving, if you're in a car, how do you pray? How do you do Ruku and Sajda? This is what happens. Ulama, the Arafa, the concept of dhikr and remembrance of God is so important. See, at every point you must make sure that you remember God. And one of the days, things that they do is that when they walk, they're praying their salat. So when they're praying their salat, there is no ruku officially as you and me do it in the wajib prayers. And there is no sajda as you and me do it in the wajib prayers. It's by the eyes. So you recite alhamd, you recite kulawala, you make the niyat of going to the ruku. Subhana rabbi an azimim wa bi'amdi. It's all the intention with the niyat of the eyes. They would leave their houses to come to the mosque for namaz al-dhuhr. Before, from the time they leave the house to the mosque, they reach. You know, one of the, we are Arba'in, that famous tradition of the 11th Imam regarding Arba'in, when he says that there are five signs of a mu'min. This is a very important hadith, you always hear it in the madras. Five signs of the mu'min. One of them is to recite ziyarat Arba'in on the day of Arba'in. In this he says, one of the signs of a moment is to recite 51 rakat namaz. This 51 rakat namaz includes 17 rakat of the normal prayers and the remaining are the nawafil, the nafila. The nafila of dhuhr and asr is four for rak- eight rakats. Before dhuhr, eight rakats. Before asr, eight rakats. These ulama, when they leave their homes, this is we need to understand. We waste our time when we travel. We are driving 20 minutes, 30 minutes just to come over here. We waste our time. They don't waste their time. When they leave the house, they make the niyat. Allahu Akbar. From the time they're walking from the house to the mosque, in the state of motion, they finish their eight rakats before Dhuhr. 
See, there has to be some difference between them and us. The difference is we don't apply ourselves. They apply themselves. They don't want to waste even a single moment. We sit inside and we listen to Noah. Fair enough, that's good. That's not bad. But there's a difference in listening to a Noah when you're leaving your house to come to the mosque to pray and offering salat while you're on your way from your mosque, from the house to the mosque. And this is that ruling, shan and nuzul of this verse, verse number 142 of Surah Baqarah, which forms the basis of this ruling. Mustaha prayers in the state of motion. You don't need to take to face the qibla. Wherever you are, east or west, north or south, belongs to God. Just do the niyat in your movements as you're driving. Start reciting, offering the prayers. By the time you come over here, you finish your nawafil. The importance of this nawafil cannot be emphasized enough. But more important than that is that while wasting 20 minutes, 25 minutes in the car coming from, to, from home to the mosque, people used it. They reached certain positions that we only can be desirous of. Why? Because they applied themselves. We be refrain to apply ourselves. We find it easier for active worship, passive worship. See, there are two kinds of worship. Last sentence and we stop. There are two kinds of worship. There's one called an active worship, one called a passive worship. People like to do passive worship. Passive worship is you sit over here, you listen. That is passive because that's easy, right? You just sit, you just have to listen. Active worship is to actually do the prayers. People would refrain from doing, you know, given an option between an active and passive, they would say passive, it's better. It's good, but there's a difference in rewards between active worship and passive worship. While active worship in the form of majalis is good, what takes a person to higher ranks is his effort to recite and remember God, which is active worship. One way of which is reciting the salat while in a state of worship as a remembrance of God as you leave your house. ربنا تقبل منا إنك أنت السميع العليم غفر الله لنا ولكم والحمد لله رب العالمين رحم الله من قرأ الفاتحة